Hi, I'm Kelly LaCroix, co-writer of Everyday Magus. You can find us at ominouspowers.com, and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Sean Murphy, co-creator of Everyday Magus and the Ominousverse. You can check us out on Linktree slash Ominous Powers, and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by not one, but two very talented and creative people. They are the co-writers for an amazing series that I just happened upon recently. We are joined by the ever-talented Kelly Lacroix and, of course, Sean Murphy. How are you doing today? We're doing great. We're not really that talented, though. It's We're faking it 100%. Shh. Makes sense. I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years and no one's caught on since, so it works out. <laughs> uh, how are you guys doing today? Yeah, not bad. Yeah, doing well. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Well, we are the Real Life Ominous Powers, Inc. The distinction is that we're INK as opposed to our in-world Ominous Powers Incorporated, which is a supernatural corporation that controls the afterlife. And we just kind of decided to name our imprint after the company that exploits our characters, because that's what we're doing. So we're, we're co-writers as Ominous Powers, Inc. And we are here today to talk about our first full-length comic, uh, Everyday Magus. So what's the concept of Everyday Magus? Because exploitation of the workforce is nothing new, at least in the real world, but how does it differ in the comic world? In our world, it's eternal employment against your will. Our tagline has been, uh, it's the great resignation meets the uh, afterlife, right? Like, Yeah, essentially after you die, what happens? You go back to work. <laughs> your spirit or your soul is harnessed and then you're just forced to do all that horrible stuff you were forced to do in your life that you didn't want to do it's just this continuation you you thought you were going to get a break nah not happening yep no days off no, no time off on the clock all the time for eternity they are always uh, menial degrading jobs it's you, you're not going to get you know your high-end creative gig where you actually get to be uh, who you always wanted to be forever you you basically have to work for someone else doing all the Joe jobs. So Ominous Powers Inc., the in-universe Ominous Powers Inc., is a giant corporation that holds many smaller companies and they farm out these souls to work in these menial small time jobs where uh, pretty much everyone is uniformly miserable. They've got uh, managers who are ex-demigods from several other cultures whose power was waning. They've decided to employ them as middle management and they're kind of the uh, hands-on overseers. Anything else we should add to that description? Just that it's really awesome and you should absolutely go to our Kickstarter and support us because look at us. <laughs> We are amazing. <laughs> I, I have to ask, are you guys okay? Because it sounds like you're um, eternally venting about past experiences possibly in this comic. But no. I, I mean, only a lot. <laughs> Like a lot. Can we delve in? So some of the stuff in the comic is informed by some things that we've actually done, like very directly. And some of them are just us kind of spinning some of those experiences into uh, other realms. Like, for instance, we've got an um, occult IT support, occult tech support. Yep. And Sean worked IT for a while. Yeah, that job was awful. Sure. Well, most of our jobs have been awful. Yeah. I used to handle dead animal parts for science what it, science dissection kits for you know high schools and stuff. It's pretty, you know, putting your hand into a, a vat of 100 cow eyeballs that are staring at you, it, it's enough to turn a person vegetarian. Really delicious. This is the first time in 15 years I'm at a loss for words. Wow. Um. <laughs> well, think about your other senses. The smell is, oh. oh. Formaldehyde, is it? Or whatever the alternative version of that is. Is there an alternative now? Because I prayed for that when I was, I mean, junior high and high school, they made us do the fetal pigs and the frogs. frogs and yeah. the worst part was the formaldehyde. A lot of that was packaged by the company I worked at. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, it's a mixture of formaldehyde and then, you know, sometimes when you get ground beef and you cook it, it's got sort of a slightly musty smell. Cow eyeballs smell like those things mixed together. So about this comic we're talking about, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I did IT for 20 years, so I understand half of that, although not really the cow eyeballs, more about management staring over one's shoulder and or looking at your keystrokes. But IT is a rough, rough, rough. <laughs> I mean, it, it just is because you're never getting people at their best and you get yelled at for 
all of the weird things that could ever possibly happen with computers, which is many. I used to talk about how printer setups was always like you need a chicken because you have to do a voodoo ritual to get it to connect. Partly is what like that joke informed this comic because the implication was that you, you need some sort of magic to make it work. It's not always a matter of turning it on and off again. You usually have to exercise the demons that are the person that's you, the user itself and then the computer. Oh, yeah. You know, looking at the creation of this comic here and, and you've hinted at, at the initial concepts of it, what is it like working together in terms of putting this as your first full length comic and what strengths do you bring to each other's creative processes? We have been friends since we were about 10 years old. So over 30 years now, um, and it is great to work with someone you can trust. We get along so well, always have. I feel like we are pretty complimentary in our differences and our strengths usually make up for our weaknesses. Um, well, you know, one person's strength will make up for the other's weaknesses. Oftentimes, anything to add? If we're gonna, gonna dive into the minutia of it, Kelly is very risk averse. Like he has to analyze things and research things and try to understand things before he takes action on them. I will just jump without looking. And where it complements each other is that we'll take risks with things, but they're always structured. Hmm. Right. So Kelly, Kelly lends that dose of structure to a lot of the like sort of rampant, let's just let's rip it and rip it ideas that I come up with. And that that works because in the areas where we take risks then become much more focused, uh, better value. Conversely, when I go off on just like a crazy tangent and start chasing rabbits, Kelly's there to go, well, that has nothing to do with the story. We need to reel it back in and get back to what we were talking about, which was you know, the perils of IT uh, report in the afterlife or, you know, how we're indicting modern work culture. And I mean, I think the way that it typically plays out is that Sean is like, he's um, one of those writers who's a real like generative, sort of a creative engine. When we come across like a, a some problem with a plot that needs worked out, Sean can rattle off five different things that go in totally different directions. And so, you know, me being more risk averse and needing to analyze things, I, I usually keep like longer term things. Yeah, I mean, I, I usually think about things like continuity and themes. And I wanna make sure that if we've got some sort of um, message we're crafting and going for that we kind of stay on that. Yeah, so That's practically how it works out and, and usually works out really well. Yeah, if we were in the Death Star trench, um, he would be the voice that's telling me to stay on target before I get shot down by a TIE fighter. Some good nerd referential material there. And I don't know enough about Star Trek to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all the hate comments I'm going to get just for that. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. <laughs> that's just going to be a TikTok video right there. You know, that's that's it's engagement, man. <laughs> <laughs> All press is good press. <laughs> oh God! You know, looking at yourselves as as creatives that you are here, and the fact that we're you have a Kickstarter campaign currently ongoing, and it's wonderful to see. Kickstarters are usually like a second job, besides getting the book funded and into the hands of the masses. You know, what are you looking forward to showcasing in this campaign? For us, I think it's really like it's a matter of building work. We we got into the title Everyday Magus from another series that we wrote. We got 12 issues in the can. It's a big story. And we started talking about, you know, what can we do to get this out there? Because it's we feel like it has a lot of value. And one of the things that Kelly had suggested is that we focus on a separate title that we can roll out through a crowdfunding campaign and use that to sort of build a body of work to show that you know our ideas have merit that we can get some traction because a lot of the modern publishing world requires you as a creator to do a lot of the late work that publishers would have traditionally done when we were growing up and now a lot of that is offloaded on to social media platforms that's kind of got us started on this and then of course because we have a persistent narrative universe um, Everyday Magus has become its own thing within our world. It, it just keeps growing and expanding. And one of the, which is one of the strengths I feel of, of doing this is we can prove that our ideas function and that they flow and that, that you can create these things and make them real. Right. A big part of this is proof of concept to say like, hey, we're for real. We really, we really mean this. We want to pursue this. You know, here's one issue. We've also got a, a short story out recently. And we've got some other things in the works in addition to the 12 issue series that we hope to do. 
that we uh, hope to build up to, I suppose yeah. I should say. Obviously, nothing is, is as it seems when it comes to the creative process. Uh, everyone finds their own creativity differently. In terms of writing, though, and this is what I always find fascinating about writers, what is the hardest part about writing? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? It's got to be the middle. I don't know. It's tough. I feel, I feel like when you're working with two people, the beginning is pretty easy yeah. because we just should sit around and bullshit all the time. Yeah. And so it's easy to spin off story ideas there, like basic concepts. Plot, yeah, that's when it starts getting tricky and we start needing to complicate things and we don't know which way to go just yet. But ending can be hard too, right? Well, I, I guess I, I feel like in our experience so far where we've gotten the, the most sort of latency buildup, another IT, you know, reference, is when we start to go into like a second or third draft and we realize, you know, here are these like glaring mistakes in the plotting because we were building up to a gag and then the gag is just so precious to us and we realize that makes no sense it doesn't it doesn't work with the character's objective and we completely drop the continuity later or even in everyday magus there's a couple of places where there are things that people will notice that hint at you know larger pieces of the world that we had cut out that to me was like that's where we start to slow down everything else for me like it felt really fast i mean this whole process has taken us a long time but just generating this that's that was very fast for us i'm with you you're, you're making a good argument what was an early experience where you learned that language had power how many times have you talked to someone and you tried to convince something so sincere like convey something so sincerely and you basically got punched in the face for it right for it and literally even just for like the most innocent things this is, might be just more of a billings montana experience <laughs> like growing up in billings but i feel like i always kind of had an idea about that well you, you know. were a young reader right yeah but that was to me that just seemed like an, a good interest to have but what got me into trouble is converting those those stories into responses to people who were bigger and stronger than me um but you know, it, like those things have power. It sometimes can come back to haunt you. But once you learn to use your words and learn to know what they mean, then you can maybe have that effect on someone else and hopefully tell them not to just quip off to the you know the guy that's a foot taller and forty pounds heavier than you. Man, I, I'm trying to. Think. I, I remember reading like Beowulf as a kid and really getting stoked about these guys going to kill this monster. And I remember there's a series called The Book of Swords. Have you ever read that? Yeah, I've heard of it. I remember getting like super invested in it and just like these kind of things that I would become really obsessed with. I don't know that I ever said that these words have power, but they clearly did because it shaped my outlook to the point where the most satisfying experience in my life was the moment that we got our uh, character designs back from Pike for something that Kelly and I had just up to that point been writing at a couple brew pubs in town. Pike being the artist. Pike being the artist, Vegas. yeah. We sent him the script, we sent him descriptions, mood boards, and all that came back. And yeah, I was like an idiotic child jumping up and down. And I realized like that, that's I guess for me, like is the moment where I go, there's a real power behind this because up until that point, it was just an idea. And then we put it into words. And then those words go out and this collaborator brings back something that so perfectly crystallizes it, I would have never expected to have seen that. It's not the first time I know, I've known that words had power, but certainly was the most impactful. I'd say for me, I was a frustrated and angry teenager when I discovered zines as a concept. That gave me a lot of power. So I was doing, at like 17, I started writing songs, playing in punk bands, and then, well, yeah, maybe, maybe 19 or 20, I started doing zines because I, I had a janitorial job at a bank and I I printed off like 600 copies of a 16 or 18 page zine and just distributed them to everybody I could. A lot of it was just these typical of the age group, just like <laughs> frivolous and super negative screeds. But you know, it felt good to, uh, I guess, own, own these words and put them out there for other people to read and maybe get to like shape the way they thought about things a little bit or to at least show them my point of view. The songs and the zines were probably the, the first like real powerful time for me. You mentioned your, your artist on this series and this kind of ties in with the next question I had here. Um, how did, well, that's a two-parter, but how did you find your artist and what was a scene that you wrote down in 
your series here that when you got the art back for it, you were just completely blown away by it. Pike went to college with my wife in the Philippines. Since we had started this process, she said, you need to meet my friend Pike. We finally got an opportunity to talk with him over Zoom. Yeah, we just like clicked. The coolest guy completely understood what we were about. And he had always wanted to work in comics. He's a fairly successful creative director right now, but he had always wanted to draw a comic. That was a lifelong goal for us is to produce comics. Coming together, the three of us, it just was kismet. Like, I, I don't know how else to explain it. It was absolutely faded and, yeah, wonderful. Man, there, there were quite a few of those. Boy, there's a... <laughs> I mean, I don't, spoilers, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to have written it, but I'm embarrassed to talk about it. <laughs> there's a scene where there's a troll that we call a cupboard troll that is stuffed into a cupboard in a, I guess it's a witch's lair. It's a coven of witches. He's there because they occasionally need ingredients from the troll, and they they pluck something sensitive from the troll. I mean, it seemed funny as a concept when we wrote it. We had each other giggling. But then when Pike actually had tweezers to give you an indication of what this might be, when he had the tweezers and he's like pulling, you know, and you can see the close up, there's like a silhouette, so you know what he's doing. It was hilarious. There were several times like that in the book where it was something that we thought would be funny, but then seeing it visually was just like a hundred times better. But I mean, we, we can call it out. We can at least call out that. That's not a, a big spoiler, right? That Pike drew the art? Oh, well, yeah. The, or what, what, <laughs> the, what the, the troll is? <laughs> Uh, yeah, go for uh, it. He invented a character called a covered troll. It's like a, a whole species of trolls that can only come in confined spaces. And so they're all BDSM trolls who are stuffed into cabinets because they want to be. That, that was just something He's that, not held there against his will. Yes, it looks like captivity, but it isn't. It's all consensual. That was something that we just were laughing our asses off because we just love the absurdity of like in the wild, these trolls like are like hermit crabs and they've got kitchen <laughs> cabinets for their shells and they can only reproduce when they're in a confined space with a ball gag. It's it's just, it's too funny. I mean, why wouldn't you want to put that in a comic? And when Pike drew it, God, it, I mean, I got it. We were, we were laughing like idiots for days. These, this is a series of firsts for me, 15 years, and that's that's the first I've ever heard of that. Like, out of thousands of comics I've, creators I've interviewed, so that's the Mission first. Complex. Yes. <laughs> we can go home now. <laughs> Ask whatever you want. I mean, like, we have no shame. It's been oiled out of us. <laughs> I mean, yeah, especially working in IT, that's just a given. I mean, sanity is the first to go, shame is second. It was gone before I started in IT. I worked in, in film and TV for oh, okay. a long time. Like what we were saying earlier, it's like all this stuff is informed by all the shitty jobs we had. It doesn't even touch all of them though. We could rattle off hours and hours. Right. Uh, it sounds like, and sometimes it sounds like we're making shit up. Like we completely lived through some of the worst jobs ever. Uh, we talk about it in our Kickstarter video a little bit, like some of the awful things. Some of the things that we didn't even talk about were near misses with crazy violent encounters and that sound ludicrous. This is me. This is, well, that's, I think that's a writer thing, really. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> is it? Or is it just undiagnosed ADD? Oh, well. <laughs> Fuel for your writing fire, that and coffee. But I mean. As you drink more coffee. <laughs> as you drink more coffee, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but now I understand why you're, you're going to have 12 issues of this stuff, because you have a lot of pent up regret and or issues that with past jobs that you need to vent. This isn't just a comic, it's actual therapy. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully on board with that. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, all the most meaningful stuff is really like that in disguise. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And thumbing our nose at it. I guess in some ways as a writer, you can't treat everything in your life as completely sacred. You have to take those sacred things and turn it on its head because Otherwise, you'll never be able to get someone else to read it and appreciate it and understand it. Yeah, it's like a weirdly, I guess BDSM trolls are a, an excellent metaphor for being a writer. But you have to hurt yourself in order to create something. <laughs> we four tortured, tortured Oh my souls. God. 
We are the cover yeah, roll. Put the ball in. You know? <laughs> and here I thought Shakespeare had it bad. Go figure. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice you've received that has stuck with you in your careers? I mean, the second wisest? I'm going to aim a little high here. Neil Gaiman said something to a, to the effect of whenever you hand something you write over to someone else to read, and give you notes back on. Whenever they say something doesn't work, they're 100% right that it doesn't work. And they are always going to be 100% wrong as to why it doesn't work, because that's up to you. And the longer that we've done this, the more often that we collaborate with someone and with each other, the more I find that the why is not always 100%, but it makes sense to explore that and then find another alternative. If something doesn't work, it means the reader, your collaborator is seeing a block. The why is malleable. When you say 100% wrong, that's not always true because you can encounter elements of personal bias and things that you haven't self-examined that are 100% not going to work and that why is important. I, I've got bad powers of recall. I can't pinpoint an exact piece of advice, but I will throw out something that I think think maybe people who watch this channel might be interested in if they don't know about it already. Brandon Sanderson has free classes that he posts every year that have a lot of really cool writing advice. I might just throw that out there if, if folks are interested and they want to write or get some cool tips. I found them to be pretty helpful. Yeah, they're good classes. They're all on YouTube. He makes really good points about how you structure something and his concept of making a promise to your reader that you have to pay for because you have to keep it. Yeah, I guess we've come back to that a few times, haven't we? Yeah, that's something that comes up a lot when we're talking about a story is what initial conditions are we promising something to pay off for later? Yeah. I think as an early writer, you're probably going to skim over it because you do a lot of that mental gymnastics to explain things. Well, especially if you're thinking long term as well, too, with 12 issues. Like, I, I think you have to not only plan things out with your outlines. If you're looking for long term fans, your first issue, like what you've currently created, is cornerstone of the world that you built. And if you can insert sports reference here, then at least you have something viable for your future. And I think from what I've seen, the the brief bits that I've seen and, and through the Kickstarter video as well, and this interview, you know, I'm, I'm understanding a little more about yourselves as creative people. And that I think it's something that you're going to touch a lot of nerves and it's going to be beneficial for you going down the road. Thank you for the kind words. Um, we certainly hope so. I, I guess we'll see, but you know, the, the aim is definitely there. We're going to keep yeah. pushing. And trying to grow and be a little more mature too. I mean, you know, that's the... Oh, you couldn't see my hand there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I guess so what I'm trying to say is like, it, it's very easy if you're writing comedy to get stuck in the comedy of, for comedy's sake. Sure, yeah. I you mean, we, we definitely do want to have serious underlying themes. Yes. Yeah. Not mature as in joyless. That's, that's for real life. <laughs> or just really bad baking videos. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? A whole village of people. Sure, yeah. I mean, like... A lot of people have certainly inspired me creatively, but there's no like one person in my personal life who's really been that person. I'm going to cheat on this question and just say that I feel like I've been very fortunate to have friends and family around me who would support my various creative endeavors. I don't know if that's a real answer to your question, but, but I've got to pass it off because that's the best I can do. I can think of several people that matter. I mean, are we talking about in terms of uh, personal integrity? Well, I mean, that would probably be my grandmother. If we're talking about her like current career objectives, I took classes from a man named Jeff Gomez who helped me drill into my individual personal trauma in order to affect a narrative universe origin so that you're always writing in an authentic voice. And that was very important to him, you know, th but that's more practical, right? Versus if you're talking about my grandmother, just like doing something that you know you, you can commit to, that you're happy with, that, you know, doesn't just pay the bills, but also kind of nourishes you, keeps you engaged with your life. That was very important. That was something that she always encouraged. From a professional standpoint, you have both created an amazing comic and you're looking to create more in the future, as well as other works we didn't get a chance to touch on, at least this time around, which means you have to come back on, talk about your past works as well too, or your future works for that matter. I'd love to have both have you on 
for that as well too. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? There's a little bit of a, a pitfall I try to be wary about in thinking about like project success equating personal success only because I'm trying to learn not to do it purposefully. It's maybe too easy for some people, such as myself, to conflate project success with like having self-esteem mm -hmm. or, you know, feeling good about yourself. I try and I'm trying not to do that as much anymore. So you're able to isolate it and just say like, I've got this project, right? And like this project might be a success. It might not. I'm going to put it out there. And then I've got this other thing lined up. Now I'm going to focus on this one. This one might be a success, might not. I'm going to just throw it out there and then I'm going to work on the next thing. So you're not getting too bogged down in that idea that you're worth idea of personal success has too much to do with project success. I've been thinking about this one. Everyday Magus, the story that we wrote, uh, it centers on a character whose agency is is limited, extremely limited. And in many ways, the way that it, it, uh, all of our agencies are limited, just having to deal with everyday life, right? The whole objective for our central protagonist, Chalk, is that he wants to be able to chart his own course. I think the fact that we are very privileged that we can decide that we're going to write comics. I personally feel on a personal level that I get to claim some success because we published a story in an anthology. We're publishing this book. We have other books ready to go. That feels personally successful because we were able to choose that. There aren't external forces necessitating us to do this. We get to make this choice for ourselves. And that to me is personal success. Project success is yeah, obviously professional success, very different. Uh, personal success is a matter of personal satisfaction. Yeah, I, I think that that's, I can claim it. You know, I don't think I'm gonna walk into a room and anyone's handing me a gold statue anytime soon, but I do feel very privileged and grateful to have been able to do this much and hopefully more. By the way, I've got a gold statue for you over here. Yes. I, I've been I, this for years. <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I mean, it's pretty easy to say that failure is the greatest teacher, but uh, sometimes you're not the greatest student. Early failures put me into a position where I thought that uh, the measure of success was something very different than what I was approaching it earlier when we were talking about what personal success looks like. Those failures eventually taught me to take success in these small things, these small accomplishments, find some measure of self-pride just doing little things, and, and that's okay. Failure taught me that. Failure also taught me that the things that I thought were, you know, my dreams that I really wanted to accomplish in life were things that I hated. Sometimes failure is a type of truth about whether or not you really want to do something or you're trying to convince yourself that you're doing something. You were alluding to your, your former job. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the former career paths that I went gone on. Sure. Yeah. I deal with failure. I try to do it in a uh, healthy way, I guess. You know, you get down like anyone else feel bad about it for a while, try not to avoid those feelings, but like, you know, just, just feel them, feel bad for a while. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be fun. And then, you know, eventually you kind of rise out of it. At that point, you can just target whoever you were blaming for your failure <laughs> and kill them or extort them. Uh, you might hijack a plane, take hostages, force them to give you a bunch of money. Things like that. Failure is all about context, right? Like it, it really is just an issue of uh, what you can take from it. And sometimes that takes a long time to learn. I, I, I think that that's very much something that we both shared and it takes a long time to learn and you have to be a little gracious with yourself. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as writers or comic creators or whatever it may be creatively, you, maybe you have inspired them on that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? So this is one I was thinking about a lot. I, I really do think that it's a matter of if you get one rung up on the ladder, turn around and make sure that you can help someone else. But, I mean, that, that's got to be the, the core component to all of that is whatever you do, don't, you know, say, fuck you, I got mine. Uh, right? Like, I, I feel like that's... I was going to recommend they silo off and just cut the other people out entirely. Mad Max style. Yeah. Well, I, I'm gonna, I, f I feel like I'm being a jerk or something here, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, again, do a, like a denial of the question. I'm sorry, Kurt, I feel bad. <laughs> uh, like, I just kind of feel like they don't really need my help. Like, I, I don't feel like people gave me advice and they were 
the age I'm at now, I'm in my forties. I didn't want to listen to that. <laughs> you know, whether I was whether I was the young kid in that position or whether I was the, the middle person, I guess, which is who we're talking about now, both on a personal level, like who am I? I'm, I, you know, I'm floundering like anybody else. I'm trying to work my way through. And then generationally too, I just feel like it's not the best place to be handing down like general advice. I would say though, that on like a one-to-one -one level, if you know somebody who's maybe in that position, then I might be willing to venture out, you know, if you've got a good relationship with someone, there's some good give and take, you understand the context of their situation, just like general advice. I just would not have taken that well as a younger person. So, eh. Why, why bother, I think. I suppose so. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we grew up with an abnormally high population of sociopaths. That's not a joke. It sounds like I'm exaggerating, but I'm fairly certain that, that we have classmates who are driving back and forth across the continent, hiding bodies in unimaginative locations because they lack the concept of irony. Yeah. Because. Yeah, no, irony is completely like, just it doesn't, doesn't process when you're a, a serial killer. The lack of irony amongst <laughs> the citizens. Yeah, there's, they've got radar that can detect that now. You guys yeah. didn't know? Yeah, no. It, Mm -hmm. Yeah, they made a, an irony radar. That's that's amazing. Wow, uh, probably definitely works twenty percent of the time. Um, <laughs> I think it was going off when I made the comment. <laughs> if your life was a comic book, what would its title be, and what would its soundtrack be? The DB Cooper story. <laughs> hundreds of people hostage, extorted my enemies for money, got away with it, received plastic surgery, and assumed a new identity by me, <laughs> D.B. Cooper. Honestly, I mean, wait, you're well preserved for somebody who had who had uh, plastic surgery and is like uh, pushing 100. They did a lot of work, uh, clearly. Uh, so my, uh, my real title would be uh, From Nine to Forever, I decided. Um, because that alludes to a work shift, obviously, like from nine to five. The conceit of the idea is that once you start working on, you know, on these creative things, you just keep going. That's it. That's if I had to choose like some overview of my life at this moment, at least that that would be a nice overview. Yeah, the soundtrack, I, I tend to be fond of um, stuff with strong melodies, but like with also like subversive element whether that be like lo-fi recording or something strange happening musically, unexpected chord changes or lyrical subversions. It would probably include a lot of that, probably like some old 77 style punk and 70s power pop, 60s pop and soul. Slash country western slash. I mean, I liked a little bit of everything yeah, in every genre. Kind of do. I've been thinking about this one too and I, I, nothing good comes up because it just sounds like I hate myself because I do. That's why I write. That's why I write. It will mostly be a, a web comic of four panels where every single joke is because I sunburn easily and have to wear like SPF 100 in the Pacific Northwest instead of because, I, you know, that's why I drink. That's why I write. Right. And uh, <laughs> for me, like my whole life's just been like one one big weird shit magnet. So there's a lot of weird things that I would want for the soundtrack of a movie adaptation. It would have to be a little Hans Zimmer, uh, some Joe Strummer. I love Nina Simone, and I have no idea where to put her so that it makes sense, but they did it in that uh, La Femme Nikita, so I guess it, you could put it anywhere. I mean, she's awesome. Well, I hate to say this, Kelly and Sean, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having us, man. Thank you so much. No problem. And before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where is the campaign on Kickstarter? You can find us at ominouspowers.com, Twitter at ominous underscore powers, Facebook, Facebook slash ominous powers, Instagram, our handle is ominous powers. We just opened a TikTok account. I believe that's ominous powers. You can find our, uh, our Kickstarter link on our website. You can also find it on our link tree. Uh, it'll be in the bios for all of our social media. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Our YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website because I am only one person. Give me a break. It is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And the podcast is back after 15 years or so. And that's at twogeekstalking.podbean.com. But you can find it on all of your streaming services like iHeartRadio and everything else like that. I got a list. Just go to the 
site and get it that way. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on to Geeks Talking.